marvelous. Yes. Uh, did you know that when his own production company goes public, that your friend there stands to walk away with $40 million? Yeah, and she's going to say that I'm just going to keep on writing that I, I, that I stole everything from you, Skipper. I'm never going to walk away from that. Well, it's all right to borrow from each other. What we must never do is borrow from ourselves. Come on. <laughs> Persona 3 opens with two universal truths. We are all born to die, and time waits for no one. <laughs> Like two sides of the arcana, we have to embrace both truths in order for all to be revealed. For fans of Persona 3, both old and new, Persona 3 Reload would seem to be one half of the truth we should embrace. The official title of this video essay, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Remake, emerged in my mind from the middle of my time playing Persona 3 Reload when the game's story, characters, themes, and most importantly the music coalesced into one and began to make me a believer. The cheesy tagline that popped through my head out of the mist of the evoker was Persona 3 never needed to be reloaded because the gun already had enough bullets. Although in this analogy, it is true that maybe the game could have used some more powerful ammunition from the upgraded Atlas Armory, principally in the form of high definition and 3D texture models and new controls over the combat characteristics. The question is, are all of the shiny cylinders of 2024 firing out blanks or are they straight shots to the target? I suppose that I am the target audience in particular, having never played the PlayStation 2 classic but having become an Atlas aficionado after stumbling upon Persona for the first time with Persona 5 Royal, like so many other modern fans found their footing in the best JRPG series of all time. For many Persona lovers, 3 is the perfect number, and the creme de la creme, a life-affirming story about facing death head-on, both literally and figuratively to the tune of turn-based battles and contrasting tonal shifts as moody as teenage hormones can get, all under the overtures of J-pop joy, inviting us to take another wander in the night. My experience with Persona 3 Reload Edition is a charm time. 150 hours worth, a timestamp which is at odds with all the people that claim this game is shorter than 4 and 5. It may be if you play by pressing X to skip as the game offers up to you, but I like to investigate and look for details and I did so on Merciless all the way through, inspecting every nook and cranny to get a sense of the passion that was put into making the world of Tatsumi Port Island feel alive and the world of Tartarus feel dead. I've come to the realization that JRPGs are some of the best games ever made and some of the worst at the same time for the ways that they hold you hostage for hundreds of hours simulating life instead of living real life. If Reload is a bit shorter, then maybe we can make the next game a bit smaller too with more aspects of replayability after the fact. And not because Atlas and Sig are hell-bent on just dropping a surprise re-release a year after everyone has already moved on in search of something else. Even if Persona 3 Reload is a remake, with most of the creative writing and gameplay logistics already worked out back in 2006, a game of this caliber cannot be disputed. And the clear jump in quality from a game like this and your average Persona spin-off is clear as a full moon. I am pleased with the result of Reload's new clothes, so much so that I am even more in high anticipation of what comes next, if and when they decide to pull the trigger on Persona 6. Of course, this is very redundant because Persona 5 is the game that made us all want to see how 6 would try to top it, but for some reason the developers at Atlas appear to be dyslexic by giving us a remake of 3 before we get the true sequel to the game that inspired the remake. On a surface level, as a fan, I think Persona 3 Reload is great, even as I am at odds with myself on how I should view such a project from a commercial and ideological standpoint. 
70 US dollars for a high quality remaster with additional content released separately, delayed in DLC, is kind of at odds with the idea that remakes are to be made to create a definitive version of a work that is in conflict with itself. If the original work is artistic, remakes are not, or at least not in this current trend of gaming. For every faithful remake, there is one that will be done for nonsense reasons and or done poorly. Even if the talent on display is undeniable, one must think deeper to question the integrity and motivation behind taking someone else's work and passing it off as new and improved. What you might have done is make something current, but don't say it's new. If you spent your energy to augment the past product, you have simply made it modern, while also watching modern become the past, like the speed of changing seasons. What was once ripe and bloom and beautiful like the cherry blossoms that only come once a year fades to the color we see on a regular basis during the boring time of year. To create the future, we have to give generosity to the present, not to the past. You do not go back in time and put your DNA in your parents. Then you would not exist yourself, or at least not uniquely as you came to be as a result of the combination that came before. Who am I? I'm a if you hold on, life won't change. Yakuza 8 has an easter egg, foreshadowing the Sega re-release that costs more than the original. There's also a constant reminder of the downward state of the modern economy, with the negative yields directly pressing down on the exchange rates, a deciding factor in the trend of repackaging the same product at a higher cost the second time. We're all sold on the idea that a classic is priceless, and I agree that they are. So why then are they getting replaced by shiny new versions of the original blueprint? Rather than copying the notes on a clean sheet of paper, why is the original blueprint not being modified to make a new formula for a different meal? Much like the famous critic Yahtzee, now publishing his reviews under the fully ramblomatic banner, I enjoyed Persona 3 Reload for what it is. Especially since I suppose that Persona 3 Reload was ultimately made for me. In spite of the fact that I have disdain for remakes, those projects that threaten to make our memories fabrications. For me, this old memory is a new one, and for many others, it may very well be a fresh look at an old anime book. Though Persona 3 Reload puts most other games to shame, it is not the peak Sona that recency bias makes it out to be. We are still waiting, perhaps to see the fruits of this tech demo for the eventual Persona 6. It cannot be understated that Reload could not exist without the creativity put forth by the original designers, the architects of Atlas for the last 20 plus years. As creator Katsura Hashino was on record saying, Persona 3 is the game that saved Atlas as a company, though I fear now it may be also the game that sets the series on a spiral downward along the path of remakes and remasters, rather than the upward trajectory of innovation in the style presented in Persona 5, the brainchild that paradoxically influenced the remake of the original Persona 3. It's great to see the original creators not only get their due acknowledgement in the game's credits, but also in the game's marketing. The decision to use a naming convention that preserves their original works by maintaining the standalone titles of Persona 3, FES, and Persona 3 Portable. To distinguish them as their own thing, not to be easily replaced by Reload, as a sign of respect and competence, even if that was the goal in making the game, to be the definitive replacement. In the same breath, the producer of Persona 3 Reload claims that greatness does not fade over time. I agree. However, if this is true, why make a remake to fade out the original? Can these two truths coexist simultaneously? In this current crusade against plagiarism, I ask the question that should be obvious. If it is not okay to borrow from others without giving something back in return, why is it considered okay to borrow from oneself without making something new? We go back to the quote I flashed at the cold open of the video. It's alright to borrow from each other, but we must never borrow from ourselves. If there is a form of plagiarism that should be railed against, it's the form of imitation that recycles old ideas and passes them off as the next level of evolution. Plagiarism is plagiarism, even if you're staring at the source in the mirror. Of course, the other side of the arcana shows us that we must steal in order to make something new, but let's not be immature about it by claiming that we are one of a kind when the other kind still exist. So many remakes today deliberately eschew the pertinent label of remake, 
the watermark that should be necessary to distinguish between an act of originality and the recycled so-called modernization that attempts to replace the firstborn, like they did with Resident Evil 4 Remake and all the others. Persona 3 Reload, in what I might add is a great piece of advertising, makes no disguise about how its very existence is predicated on the quality of the original versions, and the insistence from fans that it be updated, or as it's stylized, reloaded. In this sense, with a faithfulness close to the heart of the original, Persona 3 Reload as a standalone product manages to be a justifiable remake and, in and of itself, a great game. Its polished production values are perhaps enough to justify its existence on their own merits, even if it isn't quite the next level leap that we hope to see before this generation is over. It's also a dangerous slippery slope that Atlas could tumble down in the future if they continue to decide to embark on more remakes for games that still hold up rather well, not only as playable experiences but historic landmarks in the progression of game development and this series' particular identity. And before anyone else calls me delusional for saying this, take a look at some modern trends that fly in the face of games preservation. For the moment, the originals might be safe, but not so long as publishers lord over the copyright and decide what to do with their catalog of titles that you keep in your personal library at their discretion over the rights and privileges to the gaming storefront. Remaking Persona 3 proved successful, critically and commercially, and perhaps even artistically. But it is very much still a project of approximating the greatness of a game like Persona 5 that remains the best game in terms of pure game design and features, rather than as a personal challenge and as an experiment in making a new type of game, or at least a more imaginative one. The problem is, although Persona 3 is a certifiable classic, in being faithful to the original, the process of remaking a game shows itself to be as much of a hindrance as it is a virtue, because Persona 3 will always be held back in certain aspects of its design compared to the games that came later. In reinventing a wheel, one does little more than spin the wheel rather than building to make the car. There are, of course, other promising remakes and remasters out there, like Yakuza Kiwami, for example which is as close to a one-to-one -one remake in many aspects as one could hope for. Of course, then you get something so far out of left field that it forces us to be cynical, like the Metal Gear Solid 3 remake by Konami, because of course they will never come up with a new idea without Daddy Kojima in the wings. A similar scenario may be true for the New Age developers at Atlas. I pray they do not fall into the trap that holds hostage in the Naughty Dog experience by which I mean New Blood gets stuck working on remakes and remasters of games that have been already made, updating someone else's previous designs without being given the chance to fill in the seat that has been left vacant. If we only get adaptations, we never get to see what a new piece of theater looks and plays like. I want to see us changing seasons. Like all Persona games and all great works of art, Persona 3 exists in a particular time and place with a particular philosophy in mind. There are ideas being expressed in every frame, through ecstatic imagery and in meaningful conversations that connect the characters together through circumstance and experience while drawing us in like flies on the wall to observe intently and as active participants impacting the drama to unfold. These ideas mean something both in literal and more philosophical terms in the grand scheme of things. The writing is sharp and penetrating as the writers call out social issues as they see them presenting real-world problems to us through fictional scenarios from a distance that is just far away enough for us to remain comfortable through ironic detachment and just close enough to force us to look in the mirror at ourselves as we grow ever so slightly with the characters. There are fewer training wheels in Persona 3 Reload than in games like Persona 5, and the tonal shifts are not quite as pronounced as in other anime. In this sense, Persona 3 feels a bit more cohesive and focused even if its ambition is not on the magnitude of Persona 5. The story of Persona 3 is firmly entrenched in tragedy, with somber overtones balanced by the swanky prep school spirit and the cozy environment of the dorm that gives off a lingering aura of safety and comfort, like the people that come and go throughout. The dorm is the centerpiece at the heart of the close-knit community, joined together by the monorail that meets the horizon, where new moon meets new life through death and rebirth. The hub locations here in Persona 3 are as welcoming as in any other JRPG, on a smaller scale than Persona 5, but perhaps feeling as complete 
except for the dungeons. Tartarus is still pretty ass, maybe even by comparison to some of the dungeons in SMT3, but we'll get to that later. You play as a blue-haired loner that joins up with the most stylish extracurricular club that Japan has to offer. The Special Extracurricular Executionary Squad. A name so cool that it would have had everyone signing up if membership wasn't so selective. For only those that have the potential. The concepts of Persona 3 are fantastic. And the C's organization easily puts the investigation team from Persona 4 to shame. And it even rivals the Phantom Thieves from Persona 5. Even I have to admit that C's is just too cool of a group name. I love the fact that they all chill out in the dorm, making the hub feel homely and interactive, with plenty of activities available to offer both character and combat development by the link of the social engagements to the gameplay systems. And the new linked episodes for the male party members are short and sweet and wholesome, and it's interesting that by completing these activities, you can get some of the most overpowered buffs for battle later on. The social sim elements feel rewarding as always, and the linked episodes could be the key to a streamlined formula for the next Persona game, maybe in some combination with the traditional social links. Persona 3 Reload cuts down on some of the exposition, but at the same time it follows the wrong principle of tell, not show, for some of the most important moments of the story development. By having some major moments occur entirely off-screen, left to narration and optional research to confirm. Consider how Junpei joins the group out of nowhere. We never get to see him awaken his original persona, or the trauma that must have led to such a revelation. These important developments, which were treated as big events in Persona 4 and 5, are largely absent here, making Persona 3 feel less like an epic origin story than how 5 felt and its build-up to the grand heist, as you are assembling the gang one by one. Sly Cooper style. Persona 3 Reload tries a different approach by integrating us into the narrative rather than establishing it in real time. We know quickly that the seas has existed before the protagonist joins in the middle of the fray. It piques our interest because it feels like we're walking in on something important, something that always was. But it also feels less personal than, say, the opening act of Persona 5, which directly involves the protagonist and by extension the player, and solving a crime for which they are personally afflicted on the side of victimhood. Persona 3 Reload is certainly a better opening than Persona 4, with a protagonist that makes much more impact and much more sense for belonging in his world. Persona 3 Reload starts by moving things along quickly and concisely with a forward-moving momentum, which is the right way of doing things, generally speaking. But in doing so, it also comes together a little too quickly before turning into a bit of a slow burn through the middle act of the story, where you're just waiting around for the next deadline one that is unavoidable and without consequence if you fail to meet it. Like you might have experienced in Persona 4 or 5 if you mismanaged your time. You can do, at most, 20 floors of Tartarus, which could easily be knocked out in a single visit and have nothing meaningful to sink your teeth into in terms of combat until the next full moon. I suppose it's actually a good management of time, as this was the first Persona game that I was able to max every social link on my first playthrough for. But I also can't help but feel like the game had more to fill in the empty space if it had more ambition. Personally, I'd say it comes together nicely, but it felt a bit scripted. Maybe because it's hard to platinum these games without an organized guide to follow closely. In Persona 5, elements of the plot are buried under subtext or discovered naturally through plot progression. In Persona 3, we skip character awakenings. We are either told through foreshadowing or straight out of the many developments that will take place in advance, undermining the build-up to the inevitable. But perhaps for a more contemplative atmosphere than for the shock value of plot climaxing, the themes are literally written directly on the armband of the sleeves of the characters, and while these are good themes and powerful ones, I can't help but thinking the writing team evolved a bit in their methods of storytelling and the use of allegory later on in the series. Of course, every game has its own charm, and Persona 3 certainly ends up being a wonderful and emotionally resonant tale of friendship and learning to let go, but it feels much less like the first modern Persona game, and one that would make more sense if you've played 4 and 5 beforehand, not only in terms of gameplay, but in terms of story, or at least plot, not to mention the mechanics. I suppose the goal was to tell a story that was as human as possible, without so much of the greater mythology getting in the way. 
But this is also the game with Mr. Edogawa's rants about the symbolism of tarot cards. And one of the things I love about Persona 5 is how it synthesizes the mythology perfectly with the philosophical allegories and the subtext of the story, such as Joker being condemned to be free as the prisoner of the Velvet Room. Persona 3 feels more grounded in realism, though it does, of course, embrace escapism, with the iconic imagery of the evoker's suicide motion, which everyone can relate to as an act of defiance toward death, and as a means of getting out of the rut stuck in one's own head by blowing it out the side. It's one of the best pieces of symbolism in any story, I suppose, and it's further exemplified in the narrative by the dichotomy of the members Strega with the Seas, Strega are agents of apathy who, who possess a manic feeling of freedom rooted in the death drive. They are poetically juxtaposed against the seas who hold stubbornly onto the burdening lust for life. This is the best usage of pacing in the story as we get gradual scenes of exposition given to us as we learn more about the murky villains who rival the heroes not so much in power because they are actually quite weak compared to the shadows, but in terms of ideology and how to argue it. They are in some ways as compelling as antagonists as the series has seen. In the case of Strega though, they themselves talk a big game. They are hypocritical, with Takuya loathing the wasted potential of the true awakening Persona users making him seem more envious than self-righteous in his condemnation of the future that doesn't exist. I hope he isn't right, because I want to see a Persona 6. Strega fear coveting anything, even death, whereas Seas must learn to accept responsibility for each other as well as themselves, coming to terms with their past grievances and faults in order to become their true selves and live authentically without regret or complacency. Strega do not fear death itself because they believe in only living for the moment, not looking back or too far in front of them. But once a person finds attachment, we cannot help but cling on for dear life. This is why we cling to the past, because the past is our anchor in time, the point of reference and reflection for who we are and who we've always been. We need those links because they remind us where we've been and how we got to be. How can we go forward if we only go back? Video game sequels and remakes, if they are going to exist, should be faithful, or at least be faithful in the ways that matter, like preserving the good parts and smoothing out the wrinkles. Anyone could say this, of course, but sometimes the wrinkles are what give you character. The paradox of Persona 3 arises when they've remade the game with the same mundane floor plans, the one-dimensional and narrow dungeons of Tartarus that can never compare to the complexity and the beauty, both in style and in operation, of the voluminous Persona 5 dungeons that each feel like events and separate worlds unto themselves. For all the talk of Persona 3 Reload's beautiful and conceptual UI, there is still vastly more detail in the little things in Persona 5 Royal and in the big things as well. But let's talk a little bit about what's interesting in the design of Tartarus and the overall combat schemes of Persona 3 Reload because they did make some improvements and they do have some ideas moving in the right direction. Tartarus, much like your traditional dungeon crawler, is nothing much more than a killing floor except without the puzzling layouts of something like Shin Megami Tensei 3 or even Persona 4 to a lesser extent. This simplicity makes the experience streamlined, if not at the same time, a slog, since once you've seen one floor, you might as well have seen them all. Of course, as you progress through Tartarus, you do start to unlock a few modifications here and there that add more variety and RNG to the experience, and of course the battle music is there to keep each fight feeling as fresh as the last, but engaging in battle is still an addicting experience if you buy into the Atlas combat formula. And it's also an experience that you can easily turn your brain off to as you navigate through these somewhat heartless set pieces just to get to the destination. What Tartarus lacks is the sense of journey that Persona 5 provides by the theming of each palace corresponding to the storyline and the antagonist that doubles as the proprietor of these levels. In terms of mechanics, the variable shuffle time from Persona 4 returns, which is actually a feature I wouldn't mind returning to Persona 6 because I enjoy how it offers you an incentive for exploiting the weaknesses and utilizing the all-out attack formations that show that you know how to battle efficiently and effectively. Stacking up the bonuses and modifiers through luck and earn rewards is a good dopamine hit, 
even if it ultimately serves to trivialize a lot of the challenge that I feel Persona 3 Reload lacks, even on Merciless mode. The vast majority of all the combat modifiers and stat boosts are acquired through this method, and you may even end up leveling up your personas strictly from picking cards that boost the XP, stats, and even the HP and SP for your party by way of the Arcana. It's a bit of a time-saving feature, even if some of the other player agency is removed from Persona 5, like being able to train Personas in Lockdown and execute them to get a specialized item in return. But now, Personas can give you gifts once you rank them up to a threshold, almost like you formed a miniature bond with your own Persona. Traveling deeper through Tartarus and toppling the optional bosses behind the Monad doors will make Arcana Burst easier and more effective, and it's a good tie-in feature, even if its setup is a bit repetitive as Tartarus is tedious. The Theurgy attacks are interesting and are implemented in the same way that Persona 5 Strikers allow Showtime attacks to be triggered manually and to be banked for the right time that you want to use them. These really serve to overwhelm the opposition by ignoring weaknesses and also by the fact that they can be farmed and spammed at will. The simple fact that you can one-shot the Reaper and most other bosses by using these is either a smart time-saving feature to reduce the grind or just an oversimplification of gameplay tactics. I think it's kind of cool to be included, but it does remove most of the fun of winning a battle through attrition and luck. I do appreciate combat variety above all, so I don't mind the fact that at least Tartarus has some incentive to explore and engage with the trash mobs, as well as ways to ambush and inflict status ailments, which is kind of an extension and in some ways maybe even an improvement from the flu season of Persona 5. One of the nitpicks that I have with the leveling system and the accessibility of Tartarus is the fact that on certain days in game, your party members will make up an excuse for why they can't go to Tartarus for the evening. Not that I go to Tartarus anyway very often outside of specified days for which a trip would be opportune, but I thought that maybe they organized it this way so that you might prioritize ranking up some party members over the other. However, without a mandatory deadline before full moon and without the Mishima rank 10 confidant trait, this doesn't come across as a good design choice because rather than having a clearly defined strategic balance in order, it just kind of makes the game a bit more awkward by telling you when, where, and how you have to play in certain situations. You even have certain battles where you're forced to bring a particular party member to the fight, which could be an issue if you have them underleveled at the time. You won't get the XP for the dormant party members without switching them out regularly to fight underleveled, and the best way to get a jump in experience is against the gatekeepers on certain floors that only offer one-time experience or if you just want to nuke the reaper in the endgame. Now thankfully, by spending enough Twilight Fragments, you can sometimes trigger an event that will allow you to fast-track your party members to the same level as the main character. But honestly, a better and more simple approach is to just have the combination of the Ryuji insta-kill trait with the Mishima passive XP bonus, so your party members are always up to date as you approach the end game. All in all, Tartarus being randomized works in both good ways and bad, with more than enough advantages to make the experience as smooth as it was ever going to be, but there aren't as many cons as you would expect to balance this out and make it interesting. I never felt as endangered as I did in something like SMT3 as I was navigating dungeons without a teleporter, or in Persona 5, where you have not only a limited amount of SP, but also time to get the treasure route. Tartarus ends up being mementos with some interesting twists, but not enough to justify it being the primary battleground without the palaces to bring it all together. Yes, there are some unique story events that take you to new areas for a brief excursion, but the one aspect of Persona 3 Reload that remains inferior to the other games is the dungeon design, faithful to a fault. What I do think Persona 3 does that ranks, perhaps, as the best in the series is the maturity and diversity of the party members with everything from senpais to robots to dogs and elementary school kids. There are a lot of unique personalities on display and each character has believable development that feels organic as we trace how they were at various points in the story and the social links to who they are by the end. 
There are some social links that feel a bit copy and pasted, like the way that half of them are just being crybabies about their situations, and the way that the situations seem all too similar. But Persona 3 also has some of the best S-tier social links, like Akinari, Prison at Tanaka, Mutatsu, and Bebe, the walking Japanese encyclopedia. It's a shame that they don't also give you combat characteristics like the C's do. But each of their short stories has at least a solitary moment that will put a smile on your face and make you glad that you gave them the time of day. It's always about the coalescence of all these intersection points of the social sim and the turn-based dungeon exploration and the free music concerts that make Persona so unique and accessible. One of the most challenging parts of remaking a game, and why I don't want to see more games get remade, is that you have to replace the actors and the singer and make new music. Azumi Takahashi has a pretty voice for a pretty woman, and it helps to appreciate both of these facts at the same time as you enjoy the soundtrack that is 10 out of 10 as you would expect from Atlas. There may be some versions of the old songs that I prefer, but they did a great job with the new songs and the new renditions, especially by giving Lotus Juice a chance to sing instead of just his rapping. We cannot understand half of what he's rapping about most of the time, but it sounds good to my ears at least. And that's kind of the major takeaway from Persona 3 Reload. I don't know if it makes so much sense to remake a classic, but it looks and sounds good anyway. As Igus puts beautifully to the main character, as she is really talking to us, the audience, life is about accepting that which we cannot change in order to focus on what we can change. It's the very theme and messaging of Persona 3 as well as Persona 5. Life will change. And we have to learn to change with it. But some things do stay the same, and I prefer if we keep the classics the same while keeping them in mind when we sit down to draw up the next iteration that should be taking us to the next level. Persona 3 Reload, like all remakes, is a paradox. The conundrum of the child being the father of the man, but in a literal sense. So much of Persona 3 Reload's DNA comes from the games that came after those that were directly inspired by the original design philosophy. Persona 5 stylization was injected into Persona 3, and for that reason, in addition to the original DNA that remains somewhere hidden beneath so-called modern sensibilities that are nevertheless stylish, Persona 3 Reload makes me excited for Persona 6, which again is not saying much since I could have said the same about Persona 5 all throughout these years. Still, I've learned to stop worrying and enjoy Persona 3 Reload. It seems this game might have been made for people like me that never experienced any version of the original firsthand, and for those that cannot get enough of summoning Personas, so they will take whatever Atlas gives them, but for $70 plus. Persona 3 Reload is a baby which came out good and healthy, even if it might have got mixed up at birth. Life is all about memories, and we should not be trying to dilute old memories by replacing them. We should be making new memories that have truly never been seen before. I don't just want to have memories of you. I want to make some new memories, the kind that Persona 6 will offer because it, and maybe it alone, has the potential of the wild card.